everybody? Yes. Okay. So uh, today at GIPS, we're very happy to have Stephen Moorherd, who will talk about the phase transition for planar Gaussian percolation without positive associations. Please. Okay, so thank you, Naomi, and thanks, yeah, thanks very much for the invitation to speak. Um, so I'm going to be talking about joint work with Alejandro Rivera and Hugo Vanneville, and also a, a special mention to Lauren Kola-Schindler, who contributed an appendix to the, um, the, the final version. Um, and yeah, I'll be speaking about this work where we aim to study a class of planar percolation models, which do not enjoy this very useful and important property known as positive associations. Um, I'll explain a little bit later what that is and how it's used, but let me just remark for now that in classical percolation theory, it's a really crucial property. If you open up any textbook on percolation, this is one of the first things you find. Um, so if you're working with models that don't have this property, that really forces you to um, introduce some new tools or think about the problem in a, in a different way than is done um, classically. Okay, so let me um, begin by um, introducing the models. So they're built out of Gaussian fields. So we'll consider smooth centered stationary Gaussian field on the plane, um, which of course just means that it's a smooth function with Gaussian finite dimensional distributions um, with mean zero and invariant under translations. And we're considering the, the level set percolation associated to this random field. That is, if you fix a level L, you consider the set of points where the field takes value um, less than L, or you could consider the set of points where it takes values equal L. And you want to consider, you want to ask the question, do these sets have um, unbounded connected components or are the components all um, bounded almost surely? Um, and just by monotonicity of these excursion sets, when you increase the level, clearly the excursion set only grows. So therefore by monotonicity, there must exist some critical level um, at, at which you first have some positive probability of having an unbounded component. Um, so this definitely exists as critical level, but you don't know a priori whether it's um, non-trivial. So it could be that it's minus infinity, it could be that it's infinity, or it could be something non-trivial. Um, so one nice property of these, these models is that they have this self-duality property at the zero level because of course Gaussians are, invari is, are invariant under negation. So therefore the excursion sets below zero and the excursion sets above zero are equivalent in law as random sets. Um, and if you have a planar percolation model that has a self dual point, then it's completely natural to predict um, that the self dual point is also the critical point from the perspective of these, um, this um, phase transition of connectivity. And indeed this was a conjecture made um, by physicists um, about half a century ago. And physicists were interested in this problem because um, they considered this random field to be a model of some random energy landscape. And then if you have some particles sitting in this landscape, whether or not you have percolation of your excursion sets tells you exactly whether if you give this particle some fixed energy, whether it can escape from it some local energy well. Um, so this, this phase transition is important from the perspective of whether particles are localized or delocalized in some random energy landscape. And the physicists said, well, what, what we expect is that as soon as the field is ergodic and perhaps some other mild conditions that they don't really specify exactly, um, then you should have a uh, phase transition at this, um, at this zero level, this self dual level. Um, to be a little bit more precise about what this conjecture means it means that if your, your level is negative or equal to zero you expect only bounded components of your excursion sets and actually this is completely equivalent for some topological reasons to having your level set components all bounded for every level um, whereas if you go above zero then suddenly you have a, an unbounded component of your excursion set and moreover it's a unique unbounded component um, so one kind of heuristic way to think about this, uh, what's going on is to think of your, uh, your, your field as, an, as a landscape and to think about flooding the landscape with water um, from the bottom. And it, this is saying that um, it, when you're below zero, you just have lakes in your, you've just flooded some, some lakes that are bounded. And then as you pass through zero, suddenly your lakes merge and you get a, um, an ocean um, surrounding bounded islands. Okay, um, so it's, this is the conjecture that we're, we're studying, that we're interested in um, resolving, at least partially. And 
um, it's it's useful to contextualize it to place it um, to compare it to other perhaps more familiar self dual um, planar percolation models, beginning with, of course, the most um, simple and most well known is uh, Bernoulli percolation. So the, the famous result of Keston said that the, the phase transition and connectivity for Bernoulli percolation occurs exactly at the, the self dual point um, when you color these hexagons uh, with equal probability. Um, so this was our, our beginning of the rigorous understanding of these, this phase transition for self dual models. But it took a long time um, to extend the tools to, to be able to handle more complicated models. So the next big advance was really um, due to Bolabash and Riordan, who proved the same results for um, what's called poisson Vorano percolation, where instead of doing percolation on a, uh, on a lattice, you instead draw the lattice randomly by, by some um, poisson Vorano um, tessellation of the plane, and then you do percolation of the cells of the poisson um, Vorano um, tessellation. And here again, you have self-duality at the, the point at the um, at, at a half. And so you, again, you expect this is the critical point and that's what Bolabash Riordan were able to show by pushing the techniques beyond the, the Bernoulli setting. Um, and in a slightly different direction, Bafara Dumino Copin um, proved the same result for what's called the random cluster model, which I won't define, but is, is a dependent percolation model on, on the lattice. And they were also able to prove that the critical point was equal to the self-dual point. And, and since then, there's been, I could, I could add more models to this list, but um, yeah, this is probably enough to get the, the idea. Okay, um, so let me introduce um, the model that, or the example that really motivated our work. And this is um, a special case of a Gaussian field um, called the, the random plane wave. So to define this, it's, it's a centered stationary plane and Gaussian field. So to define it, I can just give you its covariance kernel. And in this case, the covariance kernel is the, the zeroth Bessel function applied radially. Um, it's not going to be important for the, this talk what this zeroth Bessel function is, but I want to point out its asymptotic behavior at infinity, because it's interesting to observe that at infinity, the covariance oscillates in this regular sinusoidal manner, and it decays slowly. So it has um, negative correlations um, infinitely often as you go to infinity and they're dampening but only at this one over square root rate. So it has very slow decay of correlations. Um, this definition is perhaps not so um, intuitive or to understand what, why this object's important. So it's, I think, easier to convey um, why it's important by just telling you that it's the, the, the canonical Gaussian object in the function space of planar functions that satisfy the, the wave equation with fixed energy. So if you imagine on the plane, if you fix a, an energy, say unit energy, in this function space, you have sinusoidal waves of all different directions and all different phase shifts, but all of fixed energy. And then if you think about what your, your, your Gaussian object should be in this space, for instance, if you superimpose lots of them, give them random shifts and random directions and take an average, this thing should converge to some Gaussian object. And this is exactly what the random plane wave is. It's, it's um, some sort of Gaussian object in this space. And um, that's why this is an important object because it connects to um, deterministic properties of eigenfunctions of the Laplacian on chaotic domains or manifolds. So here we have on the left, this is a, uh, here we've taken, this is a due to Bogononi and Schmidt, these, these pictures. And what they did is they considered this um, stadium domain, this classical, chaotic domain um, in dynamical systems. So this is just a rectangle with two circular semi-disc caps put on the end. And the eigenfunctions of, of the Laplacian on this, on this stadium are, um, are chaotic in the sense that if you take a, a, a high energy Laplace eigenfunction and you zoom in on some patch in the center, you get something very chaotic like this thing on the left. Here, the, the black and white to represent the, the positive and negative excursion sets of this eigenfunction of the Laplacian. And this is a completely deterministic object on the left. And on the right, we have a realization of this random plane wave. And so we see that at least um, it appears that these things have the same statistics, um, whatever that means. So you need to make um, precise what, you, what it means to compare a deterministic object with a random object. One way to do that is to think of, your, your, of viewing this deterministic object through a, a window that's given some um, random position in the stadium. And so that will give you some random some randomness in order to compare to the random objects. 
Um, but I guess the, the ultimate hope is that by studying this random object, you can then deduce some information about these deterministic objects. Um, this de-randomization de procedure was pioneered by Bourgain, um, but it's still a, a difficult procedure. And yeah, in the context of percolation, we don't know how to transfer these results back um, to deterministic objects. Okay, so that's a bit of motivation. Um, Oh yeah, so applying this, um, this conjecture to this special case, of course, we expect the critical level to be zero for the random plane wave. And um, well, so Soden made this conjecture in the special case of the random plane wave um, about a decade ago. Okay, um, so let me discuss some previous results um, giving, resolving, partially resolving this conjecture under some assumptions. So it's recently it's been proven for a class of fields that satisfy two um, structural, fairly strong structural assumptions. Um, the first assumption is this positive associations property that I mentioned. So what this means is that if you take events that are increasing with respect to the field, so for per percolation, this might be the event that your excursion steps crosses some, some domain, crosses some square or rectangle. If you take the two, any two such events, then these are positively um, correlated. Um, this is true for all of the models that I, like, I gave above, for instance, Bernoulli percolation, random cluster model, Poisson Voronoi, they all enjoy this, this positive associations property. Um, and for Gaussian fields, there's a nice characterization of when this is true. It turns out to be equivalent to having pointwise positive correlations. Um, so of course it requires pointwise positive correlations because these events could just be defined in terms of one point events of one point some um, distributions of the field. Uh, so it requires positive, pointwise positive correlations, but in fact, this is sufficient already to, to give you this full um, a priori stronger positive associations property. Okay, um, and in classical percolation, this tool, this is a really essential tool, um, especially in the planar case. This is, this is known as the FKG or Harris inequality. And why it's so important in the planar case in particular, um, we can, is because it allows for these so-called gluing constructions. So here's just a very simple example of a gluing construction. You can do much more elaborate things, but um, what FKG allows you to do is to give you some lower bounds on the probability of having some long crossing, say so crossing of a five by one rectangle in terms of the probability of crossing smaller rectangles just by superimposing them. So if you superimpose these rotated translated versions of this three by one crossing, then if all of these crossings occur by, by topological reasons, that implies a crossing of this longer rectangle, and then FKG gives you a lower bound on this crossing. And by yeah, combining these kind of constructions, you can deduce a lot of things about planar um, percolation. And actually, I think um, uh, in, in GIPS, uh, Laurent Kolashimler gave a talk, as far as I understand, about um, some recent advances um, in these type of gluing constructions. Okay, that's the first assumption. Um, the second assumption is uh, one of short range correlations. So this is the assumption that the covariance kernel decays rapidly and rapid, at least rapidly enough to be absolutely integrable. Um, perhaps something slightly stronger, but yeah, basically you want correlations to, to be integrable. Um, on the plane, this means decay with exponents uh, two or larger. And why this is important is because it allows for decoupling of crossing events on well separated domains. So if you have two boxes separated by some distance r on the same scale, then the probability that these crossing events both occur is very close to um, the product of the probabilities. Um, so, so notice that this decoupling doesn't occur for the, the whole field because these fields are uh, uh, may, maybe um, analytic. So the random plane wave is a, almost surely analytic function. So these fields actually determine um, to determine each other, but if you if you coarsen the topology and only consider um, this class of crossing events, then you can prove this uh, decoupling um, of the of the crossing events. And of course, if you want to make arguments that are close to classical arguments in percolation theory, if you have FKG and if you have decoupling, you're in a pretty good position because you can kind of hope to apply many of the tools that apply in in Bernoulli percolation. Um, so, so that's what's been done over the last, say, five years. It's been proven that under these two assumptions and some mild extra conditions, you have a phase transition at 
the critical at the self dual point zero. Um, the first such result was due to Rodriguez, who proved it for the, the massive Gaussian free field, a very special model, which has um, extra assumptions. And then there was a series of works um, proving this in general under these, um, under these assumptions, which are um, yeah, under kind of pro progressively weaker and weaker assumptions, I guess. Um, and if you only have, so basically the, the conjecture is settled completely if you have both of these assumptions. If you only have one of the assumptions, there are some partial results going back to early work of Molchinov and Stepanov and more recent um, progress by Bafara and Gaye. Um, however, if neither of these things are uh, assumptions are satisfied, then really the situation was pretty dire in that nothing was, absolutely nothing was known about this phase transition, not even that it was um, finite. So it hadn't even been ruled out that there was a, um, the phase transition was trivial in the sense that it occurs at infinity, let's say. And the random plane wave certainly does not satisfy either of these assumptions um, because recall its correlations decay slowly and they oscillate. Um, and you can kind of see just with the naked eye these, why these two properties fail by looking at this, um, these excursion sets of the random plane wave, you can see this ordering and oscillation occurring and that you have this black, white, black, white, black, white um, ordering that kind of persists for quite a long time in this picture. This is indicative of a failure of positive associations and of slow, slow decaying correlations. Um, and in fact, for random plane wave, things are actually worse because you have even hardcore constraints, um, deterministic hardcore constraints coming from the, the Helmholtz, the fact these are all solutions to the Helmholtz equation. Stephen? Yes. But this picture is for L equals zero, right? Yes, yes, yes. So yes, yes. If, if I take the uh, random plane wave and, and, and make a picture of L slightly more than zero, slightly less, then yes. will I see a, a difference? Ah, yes. So I had a, such a picture. Yeah. Um, here, so here, ah, we, have, okay. right. here we have uh, negative yeah, 0.1, here we have 0.1, and here these are coupled, so it's the same realization, and we're plotting in purple the, um, the component that crosses from left to right of this square. Um, I see. So here, yeah, thanks, yeah, thanks for the question. I, I so. didn't mention this. Um, so here you see the phase transition, but of course on any finite domain you can't really observe this, um, this phase transition completely, but at least here this is indicative of that something's going on. Yeah. Um, at the zero level. Yeah, thanks, Naomi. Okay. Um, so that takes me to, to our results. So what we do is we, we um, establish this, we settle this conjecture for really a very wide class of Gaussian fields without um, needing either of these two structural assumptions. So in particular, we prove this is true for the random plane wave. Um, we do need some assumptions, so let me make these explicit. Um, so we're, we're talking about smooth fields here. Um, we don't need complete smoothness, but we do need some um, degree of smoothness. Um, uh, we, we need some degree of non-degeneracy, but something very mild. So it's enough already if the, the function at two points along with its derivatives um, give non-degenerate Gaussian vectors. Um, you can give, in terms of the spectral measure, you can give um, sufficient conditions for this um, quite easily, and the random plane wave does satisfy this. And we do need some correlation decay, but something much, much weaker than, uh, than the, the random plane wave. So already any polynomial or any logarithm is already enough. And in fact, we just need this double logarithmic decay. Um, so the, the strongest assumption we need is, is symmetry. So I'm going to state the results under isotropy assumption, so full rotational invariance. If you if we only have partial symmetry, for instance, the symmetry of the lattice, we only have some partial results. Um, so yeah, we we did need at some crucial points to to assume full um, rotational invariance. And if we have these assumptions, our result says that the phase transition occurs at the the self dual point. And to be a bit more precise, we're saying that if the level is negative, the components are bounded. If the level is positive, the components are unbounded. Um, note, we don't say anything about the zero level. Um, I'll come back to that. But in fact, yeah, to say the critical point occurs at zero, you don't need to say what happens at criticality. That's a, a separate additional part of the conjecture. Um, but at least as a consequence, we do prove that all the level set components are bounded, excluding the zero level. So if, you, if any level set at a non-zero level must be um, almost surely bounded. And 
yeah, as I, as I mentioned, if we only have lattice symmetry, but not full isotropy, we can prove the first point of the theorem. And we can prove the second point of the theorem if we have also um, rapid decay of correlation. But if we don't have rapid decay of correlation and we don't have isotropy, then uh, we, we weren't able to prove this uh, second point of the theorem. Do you have counterexamples or just the proof doesn't work? Um, just the proof doesn't work. Yeah, the question of counterexamples is interesting. We don't really have any, any counterexamples at all, apart from the, the trivial non-ogotic cases. If your field is non-ogotic, then clearly you can construct counterexamples. But we don't, um, yeah, we don't have any uh, non-trivial counterexample for any other behavior than this um, this behavior. And and what the physicist has said is that it should be true as soon as you're ergodic. So that could be true. Um, that even symmetry is not enough is not uh, necessary um, for this type of result. Yeah, yeah. We 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 just don't know um, about counterexamples. Thanks. And for zero level, nothing is claimed. Yes, z uh, for f equal to zero. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. So we certainly we don't claim anything. Um, that that brings me on to yeah. That brings me on to open questions. Um, so the most interesting question, of course, is is what happens at criticality. Um, are the zero level lines bounded? It's certainly um, believed to be true. And if you have positive associations, then this is actually known. So there's some very soft arguments going back to Gandolfi, Keen, and Russo that say that any planar percolation model that has FKG and symmetries um, cannot have unbounded um, interfaces, cannot have these unbounded level lines. Um, without FKG, uh, there was this nice work of Bafaragaya who proved it um, in some perturbative regime. So if you if you don't have positive correlations, but your negative correlations are very, uh, very small, you know, in a perturbative sense, then they were able to prove, extend this result to such um, fields. But yeah, this certainly doesn't cover the random plane wave here. You would need some, some non-perturbative result. Um, and yeah, I would say this is probably a very challenging, um, challenging question to prove without FKG, prove this uh, boundedness at, at criticality seems to be a very, um, very difficult problem. Yeah, we would love to be able to, of course, we'd love to be able to answer this, but yeah, our techniques, uh, our techni as I'll explain in the second half of the talk, we use um, sprinkling for those that know percolation theory, we're really using sprinkling. And it's, it's the same problem as why in Bernoulli percolation, you can't prove um, boundedness at criticality um, because the study of the, the, the phase transition in, in dimensions higher than two use um, sprinkling in a, in a in a fundamental way, um, yeah, which are not strong enough to capture the, the behavior at criticality. Um, so that's the most important open question, but there are many other open questions. In fact, our result really is only scratches the surface of, 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 of the behavior of these, these models. Um, a second natural question is whether or not you have um, so-called sharp phase transition, which um, means that you, you what you would expect to occur is that if you're subcritical, if you have um, if you're at the negative levels, then your excursion sets are exponentially small in size. So you have exponentially small probability of going a distance R. This is very natural to expect. Um, we, we can prove it with strong enough assumptions. You, you don't need FKG to prove such a result, but you, you do need some rapid correlation decay because that allows you to access the kind of um, renormalization schemes, the bootstrapping um, that's, that, that's used to prove such a result in um, other percolation models. Um, but in general, what we get out of our proof, it is quantitative, but it's very weak. So this is the result in general. Um, for the random plane wave, yeah, all we prove is that you have decay that's, that's, slow, that's not even a polynomial. So we, we're not even able to prove polynomial decay. Um, but I guess happily for us, this is strong enough to, for Borel can tally arguments to work. So that, that was why we had to make this quantitative in order to construct the infinite cluster in the supercritical regime. Um, and luckily, the quantitative result we were able to prove was strong enough for Borel and Tally purposes, but it's very far from expected behavior. Okay, so um, a third question, even more, um, likely even more challenging, but extremely interesting is, is whether or not there are conformal invariant scaling limits of these models. Um, so the physicists have have conjectured that this, this random plane wave 
and probably every our Gaussian field under some, some very weak assumptions um, lie in the Bernoulli population universality class. And so what that should mean is that a criticality, if you look on large scales, your zero level lines should um, look close to this um, so-called conformal loop ensemble, which is the scaling limit of Bernoulli interfaces and faces in Bernoulli population. Um, yeah, this may seem like an outlandish conjecture, but actually it's supported completely by um, numerical evidence. Um, yeah, well, why I say outlandish, because it's not clear at all where the um, conformal invariant should be coming from. This has to uh, emerge uh, um, intrinsically somehow from the model. It's not certainly not true on any, um, before you pass to the scaling limit. So it has to emerge somehow um, when you pass to the scaling limit. And you know, for what kind of field should this be true? Well, in, in Bernoulli percolation, there's a criterion due to Harris, which tells you how slow your correlation should decay or how fast they should decay for you to lie inside this universality class. Um, certainly if correlations are decaying too slowly, then you leave this class. Um, that's for sure. But what Harris criteria says is that, um, yeah, this double integral of the covariance kernel is, is what determines whether you're inside or outside this class. And for a, a generic field, this would require that your correlations decay with polynomially with exponent three over two. But what happens with the Bessel kernel is that you have some oscillations happening. Remember, it decays much slower than this, but it's oscillating. And you have some very nice cancellations going on which, which mean that you do in, in fact fall inside this um, criteria. Um, but what that means is that to prove such a result for the random plane wave should be even more difficult than proving it for some generic rapidly decaying field because you would have to take, you would have to somehow exploit the oscillations in the covariance in order to, um, to show that you're, you're inside the, you know, the Bernoulli universality class. Um, and yeah, I would expect this is a very, very challenging problem. Okay, and finally, um, yeah, just to broaden things up a bit. So our, our results, our techniques do use Gaussianity in some um, essential way, but only at one step of the proof, which I'll, I'll mention when we get to it. Um, and there's some hope that we can extend or one could extend these techniques um, to other non FKG models of which there are many in statistical physics. So for instance, Ising models with anti ferromagnetic coupling constants, um, Certain regimes of the random cluster or, or loop models do not satisfy positive associations. If you have Boolean models, like classical continuum percolation models, but you're not working on Poisson point processes, you're working on clustered point processes, then FKG fails. And there are many other examples that don't have positive associations. And in general, these models are very poorly understood because the, the, the classical tools don't apply. And in fact, um, to our knowledge, our, our results are the first um, computation of a critical point for such a non-FKG model, at least models that aren't integrable or perturbative. Um, so as far as we know, there's no, this is the first result that actually can prove uh, rigorously uh, the existence of a critical points at a certain, um, at the self dual point for such a model. Okay, um, so yeah, I guess that's a good place to stop before I move on to the proof. Um, if there are any further questions about the results or any of the open questions. Okay, um, good. So let me now give um, the second part of the talk some, some um, outline of the proof. Um, <clears throat> so to explain uh, the proof on a, a high level, it's useful to go back to the classical approach, um, going back to Keston and also the approach used by Bolivar Riorda and Bafaro de Copain to prove that if you have a self-dual model, um, then the self-dual point um, is also critical. And what all these approaches did is that they first studied the self-dual point and they used the self-duality at the self-dual point to establish certain properties. Um, uh, in particular, box crossing estimates or Russo Simmer Walsh type estimates. I'll say more about this later. Um, but once you've understood sufficiently the self dual point, you use that as input into some um, abstract sharp threshold differential inequality, sharp threshold criteria. So, for instance, um, 
yeah, Keston did this uh, more or less by hand. Then Bolabash Riordan and Bafar Duma Kopan used a BKKKL inequality. And then more recently, there's been um, progress in the use of the OSSS inequality to do the same thing. But these, these tools give you um, yeah, criterion for when you should have a sharp threshold, but they require as input some knowledge of the, the self dual point. Um, and then once you've got your sharp threshold for um, finite, um, finite domains, then you can deduce using um, bootstrapping or something to, to deduce that this, is, this must also be the critical point. Okay, so this is the general scheme about how these proofs um, go. But mm -hmm. yes. So is it going to be very important that we are on the plane? Two uh, dimensions you, for step one. Yes. Yes. yes, yes, exactly. Yes. So yeah, this, uh, this Russo Simo theory is completely planar. Um, in fact, all these gluing constructions are more or less planar. If you, if you leave the plane and go to 3D, you can attempt to glue things together, but of course, paths don't necessarily cross in right. three dimensions. Um, so yeah, this is completely planar. And the results I gave are, are planar. Um, and in fact, yeah, for, for higher dimensions, you don't expect the zero level to be critical anymore. Um, in fact, the critical level should be should be negative, should be strictly negative um, for, for these models in higher dimensions, just like it is for Bernoulli percolation. Um, uh -huh. It's strictly less than a half um, for percolation on Z3. I yeah, see. but th there are no results in that direction um, thus far. I, I think there's, there's work in progress from well, my co-authors and some others to try to prove this, um, this strict negativity of the critical level. But yeah, so far, there's no results. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So yeah, we, we can't carry out this procedure. So why? Because, well, first of all, step one fails um, because the russo semmel wash theory, uh, these gluing constructions need positive associations in order to work. Um, and secondly, we can't use these, uh, these existing sharp threshold criteria because they also um, implicitly require positive associations. So they're, they're abstract statements. Um, so you might hope to apply them but if you actually try to apply them, you, you soon see that the situation is pretty hopeless if you don't have positive associations. Um, yeah, so both step one and step two uh, fail for, for instance, random plane wave. Step three is fine, um, more or less. Um, so, so what do we do? Well, uh, yeah, I guess our first insight is that um, reversing the order of the first two steps gives a nice way to bypass positive associations. What so, is RSW? Uh, yeah, sorry. So RSW is um, Russo Simo Welsh. So this is these are the, the pioneers of these kind of box crossing gluing arguments in in percolation oh, theory going back so to um, the eighties. Yeah, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about yeah what I mean by this Russo Simo Welsh theory. But yeah, this this is a it describes a sort of a class of planar geometric constructions in which you use gluing to um, go from statements about uh, symmetric crossings, say the square, to non-symmetric crossings, like rectangles. Um, yes. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, Russo Simoash. Um, right, so we can't, um, we can't apply the existing Russo Simoash theory because it uses, uh, in these gluing constructions, it uses this positive association um, correlation inequality. But what we observe is that if you reverse the order of the first two steps, you can get something, um, you, you can think about the problem in a different way. So what that means is that before studying the, the self-dual point, what you should try and do is prove sharp thresholds exist for crossing events on large scale, but without attempting to identify where that threshold occurs. In, in the classical approach, you first say, well, I expect self-dual point to be critical, and then I prove a sharp threshold around that point. We're saying actually no. It's what you can do is prove sharp threshold results without ever identifying where that threshold occurs, um, at least in the first step. Um, but as I mentioned, we we can't use the existing approaches to do that. Um, if if you had positive associations, you could do that just using the existing approaches. Um, yeah, but but we we were un unable to do that. So we have to introduce a new technique for sharp thresholds, which is based on what we call um, threshold delocalization, which I'll explain um, next. And 
once you have the fact that all your crossing events on large scales have sharp thresholds, even if you haven't identified where that threshold occurs, what you can do is inject that into Russo-Simmer wash type gluing constructions to um, deduce crossings of rectangles at any positive level. So this is where the sprinkling comes into it because we're, unlike in the, the classical approach where you prove Russo-Simmer wash at the self-dual level, here we're only proving it at, um, at strictly positive levels um, using the fact that we already have sharp thresholds. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll explain more about this as, as well. And finally, the third step is, is basically the same. Okay, so that's a high level picture of, of the approach. Let me go through these steps in a bit more detail. Um, so yeah, perhaps what, one interesting aspect of the proof is, is this new sharp threshold criteria that we give. We think this could be useful in other contexts. Um, let me remind you what the kind of basic heuristic is that governs sharp threshold results um, across the board. So that's, um, to paraphrase something Rousseau wrote is that you expect that if you have a, a function of a lot of different independent coordinates and you have an increasing event, then you expect this to have a, a sharp threshold if none of the coordinates are too influential. If the influence of the coordinates are kind of spread across them, that's exactly when you expect um, sharp thresholds to occur. Um, and yeah, this is a very old idea and um, a lot of different, and it's a little bit vague as stated because it begs the question, well, what do I mean by influence of the coordinates? And there are, there are by now many competing ways to measure the influence of a coordinate on some increasing event. So maybe the most familiar is, is that of pivot pivotality. So you say that a coordinate is pivotal the, to the event. If um, going back to the setting of a Boolean function or, or Bernoulli percolation, if um, flipping the bits uh, that coordinate is enough to change the event. If really the event depends um, in a pivotal way on that coordinate, you would say that coordinate is influential and the influence is measured by the probability of that coordinate being pivotal. Um, in, at least in, in percolation theory, this is perhaps the most common you know, if, when you're when studying Bernoulli percolation. Um, for more dependent models, say the random cluster model, it's useful to generalize this in a, in a way in a way to um, the covariance between the function at that coordinate and the event. So this is another measure of influence. In fact, it reduces to pivotality in the Bernoulli case, but it's a little bit more general. Um, and then there are uh, more algorithmic ways to measure influence, which is if you have some exploration procedure or some random algorithm that, det that uh, determines the event, you can just ask for the probability that that algorithm had to reveal that coordinate. Um, that's another measure of how influential that coordinate is. Um, yeah, what, what we do is we propose um, a new measure for influence, which is the probability, at least new, we are, we're not aware of any of this being proposed earlier. Um, yeah, so, so this new measure is the probability that a coordinate is exactly the location of the threshold. Um, yeah, what, what that means um, I'll come to it in a second. I want to point out a difference between our measure and these other me these other measures. So the key the key difference is that these previous these other ways to measure influence are defined at a fixed value of the parameter. So if you fix the parameter p or the parameter or the level, you can determine uh, the influence in these sense. Whereas this new measure that we're proposing is only defined if you have a monotone coupling of all of your parameters. Um, at the same time. So it's going to depend not just on a single value of the parameter, it's going to depend on a whole coupling of all of the parameters. So already that requires you to have a monotone coupling um, of, your, of your models. Um, but happily for level set percolation, it comes built in with a monotone coupling because it, in, in fact you have, the, that's the very natural way to view the model is that you have first your field and then your level changing, which gives you um, precisely a monotone coupling of your excursion sets for all levels. Okay, so what is this um, threshold location? So let's consider some topological rectangle, which we'll call a quad. If you like, you can just consider a, a square or a rectangle. And the event that the excursion set crosses this um, rectangle from left to right, um, 
when you restrict the field to the rectangle, you have a crossing. Um, this, is, this is known as a crossing event. So since we have this monotone coupling across all levels, there must exist some random threshold such that the crossing does not occur below this threshold, but does occur above this threshold. So this is again, purely by monotonicity of your coupling. When you raise the level, your excursion set increases, at some point it's gonna connect left to right. Um, and moreover, because we're dealing with smooth fields, and in fact, almost surely Morse fields, um, as we can associate it to this change in topology, a location in space. So we can associate a unique um, location at which this change in topology occurs. So here, uh, let's see in these pictures on, on the, the top panel, here we have a change in topology occurring at this point in the middle of the rectangle. As you raise the level, this black joins together at this point and then becomes a crossing. What also could happen is that this change of topology occurs at the boundary. So for instance, in this bottom panel, this black is merging at a boundary point to change the topology. So here the threshold location is on the boundary. Um, it could even be on the corner um, with positive probability, but there must exist a unique spatial location at which the topology changes. And the, the function value, the field value at that spatial location is just equal to the, um, the height at which the the, the, th the topology changes. So associated to this crossing event and this realization of the field, we can identify a spatial location and a height at which um, the threshold changes, at which the topology changes. Okay, so what our sharp threshold criterion says is that the concentration properties of the height of the threshold is equivalent to the delocalization property of the space, spatial location. In other words, if none of the spatial locations are particularly important, influential in the sense that they all have low probability of having the um, topology change at that point, then that's actually equivalent to the, 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 the threshold in height being tightly concentrated. And when we talk about sharp thresholds, what we want is to see is the left-hand side of this equivalent. And so the criterion says it's enough to study the right-hand side of this equivalent. Um, yeah, for those that know BKKL inequality, this is highly reminiscent of, um, of the BKK inequality that, that low influence, if you have low influence everywhere, that implies um, concentration, sharp threshold. Um, okay, and where does this type of criterion come from? So it's not, it, it, it's, it's our idea in the context of um, percolation theory, but actually it's really due to Chatterjee in the context of, um, Super, of a maximum of Gaussian vectors, because what Chatterjee observes um, is that the, the concentration properties of the maximum of a Gaussian vector are related to, in fact, equivalent to the delocalization um, of the argmax. If you have a Gaussian vector and none of the coordinates are particularly likely to be the maximum, that tells you exactly that the maximum has to be concentrated around its mean. What is concentration? Um, you mean in this top line? So, so it's going to be a, we're going to make this quantitative. So, how strong you prove delocalization um, it tells you how strongly you can prove concentration. So, concentration in the sense of um, the, the the variance is small or the, the mm. tails are small. Oh, I'll take you. Yeah, concentration of measure. I mean, this t is a random variable which is real valued. So, it just means that this random variable is tightly concentrated around its mean. Um, in the usual sense. Yeah, so let, let's state a precise version of the result. Um, well, the harder direction. So one direction is kind of easy, which is that if, if you don't have delocalization of the critical points, then you can't expect concentration just because there must be some fluctuations of heights. Uh, if you know your, your critical, if you know your threshold saddle points is say located uh, in the center of the square, then there's some fluctuations of of the height of that saddle point, which tell you that the, the threshold could not be concentrated. So one direction is kind of easy to see. The hard direction is that as the delocalization implies concentration. So here's a, a quantitative version of that. It says that there's a constant depending only on the covariance kernel, such that for any quad, the variance of the threshold height, that's a measure of concentration, 
is upper bound by, um, well, you're allowed to take an infimum over all mesoscopic scales. So this is R. And if your covariance kernel decays, this left-hand side will be small. And if your, uh, your, your threshold location delocalization delocalizes, this right-hand side will be small. And so if you can prove delocalization, you can take R large, which makes both of these sides small, which makes the variance small. Um, yeah, this kind of funny, this maximum thing is, is quite natural in the proof. I, I won't mention, I won't have time to go into the proof, but uh, it basically relies on, um, on hypercontractivity properties of the, the onstein uhlenbeck semi group. If you know interpolation arguments, uh, well, I'll, I'll point you in the direction of Chatterjee's book on superconcentration if you want to learn more about these type of arguments. But basically, you, you, you get an exact formula for the variance by interpolating along the onstein uhlenbeck semi group in the same way that you would prove, say, Slepian's lemma, for instance. And then you say, well, either the, the, thresh, the saddle points, the threshold saddle points stays close to its original position, in which case hyperconstructivity um, shows the contribution to be small, or it jumps far away, in which case the covariance shows it to be small. So these kind of two possibilities give you these two parts of the bound. Um, but as long as you delocalize asymptotically, then the variance goes to zero and you have covariance decay, then the variance goes to zero. Um, yeah, so if you're more familiar with say Boolean functions, um, you can do the same thing for Boolean functions because they're just Gaussian, you can view them as Gaussian vectors with, with a trivial covariance structure. You can prove the same type of result, but actually in that case, it's really a, a consequence of telegrams um, L1, L2 inequality. So yeah, one, if you're familiar with Boolean analysis, you can view this as some, some Gaussian generalization of telegrams uh, L1, L2 um, inequality. Okay, good. So why is this useful? Well, it's extremely useful criterion for us because you're able to prove delocalization. Uh, let me just um, compare, say, to uh, um, Okay, maybe not. So let's, yeah, okay. So why, why is this useful? Because um, the fact that there's a unique, um, a unique saddle point helps you show that it's delocalized. So unlike the influence in other measures, which can, can be kind of spread out, but they, they, there's, no there's no kind of unique pivotal point or there's no unique point at which the algorithm reveals, um, here you have uniqueness. So there's a unique saddle point at which this occurs. And you can really use that uniqueness to help you show delocalization without needing any strong structural pro properties. So for instance, what we were able to show using only very soft properties, namely ergodicity and symmetry, we can prove that this delocalization occurs um, asymptotically as the scale of the quad grows. So this is a, essentially a consequence of two things. First, you wanna show that delocalization occurs in the bulk of the quad. So how could, how could there be localization well, it would only be true if the field was quite likely to have a saddle point where the arms of the saddle points went very far away. Because that's what happens at this, um, at this threshold point, you have a saddle with very long arms. And if you can show that there's almost surely no saddle point with infinite arms, that's already enough to show delocalization in the bulk. Um, Whereas on the boundary, you want to do something similar, but what you want to show is that there's no unbounded level lines in the half space of the field. Because close to the boundary, the field looks locally like a half space or the quad looks locally like a half space. And so it's enough to show that there are no unbounded level lines in the half space. And that's much easier than showing there's no unbounded level lines in the plane. You can use the fact that there's a boundary to help you and you're able to show this is true just using soft properties. Um, and yeah, the, the, the first argument is basically a Burton Keene type argument. The second argument's um, closely related to something that Harris um, did. Um, okay, so what the upshot is, is that using the sharp threshold criteria and combining with these, these arguments, you show that for every quad, you have concentration asymptotically. Um, but note that we're not saying that the threshold occurs at level zero because we don't know where the mean is. We know that there's concentration around the mean, but we don't know where the mean is. And a priori, it could depend on the quad um, and it could depend on the scale. 
So it's not clear at all if you've made any progress to prove that the zero level is critical because you haven't said anything about the mean of these, um, these thresholds. So this leads to step two, um, how you combine this a priori sharp threshold estimates with russo walsh type constructions to deduce the phase transition. Um, so, so what russo walsh theory is in a kind of vague, vague um, description is that it's arguments of the following form. So starting with the fact that squares or some symmetric thing is crossed with some non-negligible probability, you want to kind of glue together crossings to deduce the same thing for rectangles. Um, so these arguments use positive associations in an essential way, but what we're able to do using um, recent advances in this theory due to uh, Tassian and Kola Schindler. So I, I believe uh, Laurent spoke about these type of um, these advances in, in December in chips. Um, so combining these new constructions due to Tassian and Kola Schindler with this a priori knowledge on the um, concentration, you can prove a sprinkled version of Rosa wash which says that if you know squares are crossed with non-negligible probability, you no rectangles are crossed with some high probability at a positive level. Um, and yeah, I guess it, rather than try and explain these constructions, um, yeah, what's going on is that we're, we're replacing positive associations with the union bound. That's essentially what, what, what it is. So what, what we did is we, we rewrote some, so Tassian and Kola Schindler, their arguments are all, um, written for positively associated models because that, that's what they're interested in. So what we did is, is rewrite their constructions in a way um, that once you have this a priori control on the threshold, you can replace positive association in a systematic way with the union bound. And that leads to um, crossings with high probability, but only at some sprinkled level because you have to raise the level in order to boost your pro probabilities um, somewhere close to one so that when you do union bound, you don't lose too much, basically. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to explain a bit more detail, but I guess um, I don't have too much time. So let me let me just say what we need to do to complete the argument. So with these two steps that I explained, it's already enough to prove the easy part of the, the theorem. So the easy part is showing that um, the critical level is not positive. Uh, so yeah, recall from the history of Keston's results that um, the easy part was already known 20 years earlier due to Harris. So Keston, um, his result in the 80s was not the easy part, it was the harder part. So here, yeah, the, the easy part is, is already done. Um, the harder part is uh, proving that there's, uh, that there's unbounded components as soon as you're strictly positive. That's the harder part. So why is it harder? It's because we need to, um, make quantitative the, the existence of crossings of rectangles um, at this strictly at this positive level. So what comes out of the previous two steps is the fact that you have some subsequent scales at which your crossings go to one. So that's not enough for this harder part. You need to make this quantitative. Um, so first we need uh, to make the delocalization of the threshold saddle um, quantitative. The, the two arguments I gave briefly, this um, Burton Keane argument and this Harris argument, they're only strong enough to give you qualitative delocalization of the threshold saddle because they're, they're both ergodic arguments. So all they can tell you is that the, the density of the threshold um, location goes to zero, but not at any rate. So we were a bit stuck for a long time because we, we knew we needed this to be quantitative, but our arguments didn't give it to us. So in the end, we had to bypass things by using assumption of isotropy um, to get the quantitative delocalization for annular circuits. So if you consider not crossing of squares, but crossing of annuluses, then by rotation invariance, the unique location of the, the threshold has to delocalize at least around these, um, these rings. So this is already some quantitative control and that turns out to be enough. Um, so second, we needed some quantitative control on the subsequence of which this type of um, statement holds. And here we really use the, the recent advances due to Kola Schindler, who um, yeah, happily agreed to write an appendix uh, to the paper where he um, adapted his arguments to work in our setting. And finally, 
we needed a, a large deviation version of the, of the sharp threshold criterion. And here we used an idea of Tangi, who was working in the super concentration of Gaussian maxima setting. So Chatterjee proved uh, this variance bound, Tangi boosted it to a large deviation concentration bounds. And that's exactly what we needed to get this quantitative um, control. Okay, so I think my time is up. Um, yeah, thanks for your attention. And yeah, this is uh, the link to the paper. Thank you very much, Stephen. Are there any questions? Uh, sorry, why point SQ is uh, uh, almost surely unique? Um, okay, yes. Uh, so it, it may not be true for an arbitrary function. If you have an arbitrary function, it may be that there's two saddle points at which the topology changes, but we're dealing with uh, Gaussian fields that are almost surely Morse functions. So their critical points all occur at different levels. Um, they're all distinct levels and they're all locally um, saddle points. So that means that when you, when you raise the level, um, this topology occurs at a unique saddle point. Um, if, if it occurred at two different points, it would mean that there were two saddle points at the same level. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Thank so you. this is yeah. So th this is why we're, we're this argument only works for smooth fields. You might wonder, well, does this phase transition occur also for rough Gaussian fields, say Gaussian sheet type objects, or some stationary version? And you would expect the same phase transition occurs, uh, but actually here we're really using Morse uh, Morse properties to control this. Um, yeah, this, this, the fact that this saddle is unique and to, to show that it delocalizes. Um, if you have a rough function, you have um, a much more complicated uh, change in topology occurring at the critical level. And so, yeah, it wasn't clear to us how to extend this type of argument to rough fields, even though it, it may be possible to do so. Um, yeah, but here our realizations are all very nice. So we have this uniqueness. Um, Oh my sure. Sorry. So, so some non-degeneracy condition have to be fulfilled, huh? Uh, yes, precisely. Um, but actually, the non-degeneracy is very weak. So it's just what I mentioned here. It's actually enough. It's enough for the the function and its derivative at two points to be non-degenerate. That's mm -hmm. all you need in order for this um, these these critical points to be almost surely distinct. Um, we needed C3. You may think, well, C2 should be enough to be, to be Morse, but actually C3 was, was needed for some technical reasons. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. So for, for, the, uh, for your new uh, definition of pivotality, do you really need the monotonicity of the coupling or um, you can just define it as the first time for assuming that you know that there are two trivial regimes as the first time that there is a crossing or the first level. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. So you're saying if you don't have this monotonicity, but you define it in a way that makes it unique, can you deduce such a criterion? Um, Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. I, I, I can't say I thought too much in that direction. But yeah, this, this monotone coupling, yeah, it'd be very nice to, to generalize this beyond that because for instance, yeah, a big open question in, in say the random cluster model is what happens when the parameter Q is less than one because if the parameter Q is less than one, you lose your FKG and you lose, yeah, basically there's nothing known about the model in that case. Um, one problem, to try and use this analysis is precisely there's no monotone coupling um, of the model in the, in the regime Q less than one. And in fact, it's quite common for non-positive associated models to not have a, a monotone coupling. Um, yeah, some do, some don't, but it's certainly not um, yeah, something that holds for all non-positive associated models. So it's a fairly strong um, restriction on this method. But yeah, you, you make a, a raise an interesting points. Um, but yeah, I don't have anything sensible to say about it. Thanks.
And Stephen, maybe could you say a word about how to show that the variance of T, uh, it goes to zero? I think um, you might have said, yeah, but. Yeah, okay. So I, I didn't really explain this result. Um, mm -hmm. So what, what you do, okay, there's two things to do. So first you use um, interpolation. So yeah, think, think about the proof of, of Sleepian's lemma. You can inter you, you interpolate between the two. Uh, if you're trying to com compare two discrete Gaussian vectors with different covariance structures, you can interpolate between the covariance structures in some natural right. way. Um, so the same thing happens for a smooth Gaussian field. Um, you can interpolate between one realization of the field and an independent copy by interpolating along the ornstein ullenbeck semigroup. You kind of relax the field to equilibrium. And if you do that, then the variance is, is nothing more than the integral, is exactly is equal to the integral of the change in the covariance of um, when you do this relaxation. So you have a, a nice uh, exact equality for the variance along this interpolation. And what you then want to do is, is exploit the hypercontractivity of this interpolation. So th that, yeah, that basically means that rare events uh, yeah, get, get, get smoothed very quickly by this interpolation. And what that, what, how you use that is that when you do the interpolation, this saddle location will move around space. Hi. It will start somewhere and it'll move around and eventually become an independent copy of itself. And there are two things that can happen. Either it stays very close to its original point or it goes far away. And if it goes far away, then you have covariance decay that tells you the contribution is small, whereas, which is the first term here. Whereas if it stays close, if you're delocalized, that's a very rare event. And if it's a very rare event, you have hypercontractivity telling you that that becomes even more rare. Um, for it to stay close for a long time. Um, yeah, if it's very rare for it to be in a certain place, then if you relax the field, it should be even more rare for it to still be close after some time. And those two things together combine to, to tell you the variance is small. Yeah, this is not at all our, this is not at all our idea of proof. This is really something, um, something due to Chatterjee. But um, yeah, I'd recommend his, his book on super concentration. It gives a very nice, introduction to these interpolation arguments and shows how they imply similar results for, uh, for the concentration of the maximum, for instance. Thank you, yes. Sorry, your result is specifically two-dimensional, yes? Um, actually, this result here is not two-dimensional. So this result here is completely general. Um, yeah, this is true for but... any, any dimension. But uh, the theorem about percolation is two-dimensional, yes? Yes, yes, exactly, yes. So, so this part is true in general and it could be useful to study the problem in higher dimensions. But yeah, when we combine this with these planar gluing constructions, this Rousseau wash theory, this is extremely planar. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, the results. In fact, the results is false. I mean, it's believed to be false in higher dimensions. The critical level should not be zero. Um, it should be negative. Should be strictly negative. Yeah. Yeah, the zero level sets of a three dimensional Gaussian field should be unbounded, in fact. Um, there should be a unique unbounded component of the zero level set. You mentioned uh, Harris uh, criterion uh, of. Uh, uh, yes. It is uh, hypothetical criterion, huh? Yes, 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 yes. It's very, it's very heuristic, and it's it's actually if you look at the the justification, it only works in one one direction. It only says that if this thing is true, then you might believe that you're close to Bernoulli percolation. It doesn't. The, the converse doesn't. There's no argument for the converse in this criterion. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, whether you believe it's if and only if is, yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm not sure. I, I completely believe it, but certainly the heuristics say that if this thing is true. Basically, this criterion tells you when you should expect decoupling of event of crossing events on um, separated domains, which is mm -hmm. um, which you have to you have to see if you're in the if you're in the Bernoulli University class, this decoupling has to occur, and this criterion should tell you when it occurs. Um, yes, this is criterion for the conjecture to the uh, uh, 
CLE6 or conjecture, or what for what conjecture it is, uh, for what hypothesis it is, uh, condition? Um, for, for when you converge to CLE6, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure if, uh, yeah, I don't know if, I don't know if people necessarily believe this is the exact criterion or not. Um, it's quite, yeah, the heuristics are not that convincing. Uh, but certainly for the random plane wave, these are numerics have been checked um, rigorously. Uh, well, not rigorously, they've been checked uh, in detail and it seems to be true. I don't know if it's been checked for other fields. I'm not aware of any numerics that check this uh, conjecture. Um, for yeah, for other fields. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So, thanks a lot, Stephen. Thank you uh, okay. for a very nice talk. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, stay tuned. We'll meet again next week. See you all. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. It was very interesting for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no problem. Yeah, I, I recommend this, this strategy book. It's very, yeah, for people studying Gaussian processes or fields, I think there's a lot of 